it's not good to make assumptions, right? It's not good to assume things of the people that we are coming into conversations with. One of the biggest assumptions that we make as followers of Jesus is that people are not interested in talking about Jesus. That is not a good assumption to make. As followers of Jesus, that is one of our main callings, is to talk about what we have experienced, what we have encountered in the living God. This is our ministry. This is the reason that we are here. Now, many of you are saved. I I would say the majority of the people in this room, you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But guess what? It's not, now you don't just put it on cruise control and just kind of hang out until you die. There's a lot of work to be done. And that work that we have to be done is to show and tell the love of Jesus Christ into the world around us. Amen? Amen. Amen. 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 5 says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. Anybody recognize that in the world around them right now? But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. They will turn away from listening to the truth and they will wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded. That means clear thinking. Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. This is our calling as followers of Jesus. Those last two statements there, do the work of an evangelist. What is an evangelist? An evangelist is not someone who stands up in a $5,000 suit with gold rings and asks people for money. That, that was not ever God's intention for evangelists, right? But unfortunately, that's the thought that comes into a lot of people's minds. An evangelist is simply someone who takes the good news of Jesus with them everywhere they go. And then the final thing he says is this and fulfill your ministry. Now, a lot of people hear that and they go, (laughs) I'm out, Pastor Tanner. I'm not in ministry, so I don't have to do this. This is not talking about me. Well, you're wrong. Just going to be honest with you. We are all called to ministry. You may not be a pastor of a church. You may not be working on a church staff, but we are all called to ministry. 2 Corinthians 5.18 says, all of this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Who did he give it to? Us. Us. That means all of us have the ministry of reconciliation. Reconciliation is bringing two parties together that have previously been separated. Our ministry is to bring people who are away from God back into relationship with God. He goes on and says, that is in Christ Jesus, he was, I'm sorry, that in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, but entrusting to us the ministry of reconciliation. You know what our message is to the world? God forgives you. Jesus died for you. You don't have to live in brokenness. You don't have to live in addiction. You don't have to live in sorrow and in regret. You don't have to stay addicted to that alcohol or to that drug. You don't have to keep going around the mountain. There is freedom. There is forgiveness. There is hope and there is salvation in Jesus. Who wouldn't want to share that message? That's the best news there is. And I think for myself, there was a time in my life when I was fearful of talking to people about God. But I think the reason that I was afraid to talk to people about God was I hadn't really fully bought into the message. But now that I've experienced the fullness of his grace and his mercy and his goodness, I can't help but tell people what I have known in my Jesus. Because he's done it for me, I know he will do it for them. Now in the book of Genesis, we're, we're in the part, of the, the, the part of Genesis where we're going through the life of Joseph. Joseph had been given a dream by God that he would one day be a ruler of a great people. And 
Joseph lived his life according to that dream. It, it, per, it propelled him forward. When he go, went through these difficult times, when he found himself in the pit, when he found himself sold into, into slavery, when he found himself put into prison, and when he had to stay in prison even after he had been obedient to God, it was the dream that God had given them that kept him moving forward, that kept his eyes on the prize. But you know what? The dream wasn't for Joseph. God didn't give Joseph a dream for himself. God gave Joseph a dream because of the people that the dream would impact. God has given you a dream. He's given you a purpose in life. He's given your life meaning. He wants to fulfill that meaning, but it's not going to be about you. A dream that's about you is only a fantasy. A dream that is about others is a dream. It's a legitimate dream from God. Because it's not about us. Joseph was willing to use his voice for God. And God used Joseph's voice to save the entire known world at that time. God wants to use our voices. He wants us to speak for him also. This morning, through the life of Joseph, we will learn how God will move in six incredible ways if we are willing to talk about him. Are you guys willing to talk about God? Let's say a prayer. Holy Spirit, I just want to invite you to invade this morning. Invade this space. Jesus, before you died, you promised that you would give us your spirit. And after you rose from the dead and after you ascended into heaven, you sent your spirit. And you sent your spirit so that we could become bold in our faith. So that we could receive power to be your witnesses. To talk about you to the ends of the earth. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would fall upon us this morning. Help us to receive this word and help us to apply in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Genesis chapter 41 verse 1, it says, After two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. I love that this little phrase is added in here. You know, it helps that when you study God's word to kind of take your time and slow down. Because when you slow down, you notice things that maybe you wouldn't if you're just trying to read the chapter a day to keep the devil away. You want to slow down and enjoy this meal that God has given you. And the word that stuck out to me here was the word whole. God could have said for two years, but he said for two whole years. In other words, Joseph, even though he was obedient and interpreted the dream of the cupbearer and the baker from last chapter... Even after he did that, and even after his interpretation came true, he was still stuck in the prison for two whole years. I don't know why. I don't know why you have been stuck in the place that you're in for the amount of time that you've been stuck there. But what I do know is that my God is faithful. And I know that he always comes through. Habakkuk 2.3 tells us, for still... The vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. That dream that God has given you, that that desire he has put in your life to be a blessing to other people or to somehow help other people or whatever it might be, don't give up on that dream. It's coming. It might seem slow because guess what? Our timetable, we want everything done now. And the faster our culture, the more our technology develops, we expect things to happen immediately. I find myself, if an internet page doesn't like just like pop up, I'm like shaking my computer. I remember in 99, you loaded an internet page, you went, took a shower, made a sandwich, took a nap, and came back and it was half loaded. But now we expect things to happen immediately. Anybody else old enough to remember those days? That was sure fun. So the story continues, and I'm going to summarize verses 2 through 7. Pharaoh had two dreams. Now, in the dreams, um, there were seven healthy, very healthy cows that came up out of the Nile. And they were followed by seven ugly, starving cows. And those starving, ugly cows ate the healthy cows. Kind of a scary dream. Then seven very healthy stalks of wheat came up out of the Nile, and they were followed by seven that were scorched and dying, and the unhealthy ones again consumed the healthy ones. Verse 8 tells us, so in the morning, 
Pharaoh's spirit was troubled. And he sent and called for the magicians of Egypt and all of its wise men. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was none who could interpret them to Pharaoh. If you are willing to talk about God, he will give you a divine appointment. If you don't know what a divine appointment is, a divine appointment is when God opens the door for you to talk to other people about him. As simple as that. That's a divine appointment. And if you're willing to talk about God, he will give you these divine opportunities where he will open a door for you to begin to tell people about what you know about Jesus. And these are amazing opportunities. But they don't just happen, right? Last week we learned that you actually have to be watching for these things to happen. You actually have to be paying attention. God's not just going to, you're not going to just be walking along and God's going to be like, here you go. (laughs) Sorry, Jason, we'll get that in before the back surgery. All right. Are you okay? Workman's comp claim? Yeah. God's not just going to shove people at you. You're actually going to have to pay attention and be prayerful and be watching, but God will give you a divine appointment. But if you notice here in this story, Pharaoh has a dream, but it's been two years. Joseph's been in prison two whole years. The reason that I think that this happened was because if Joseph would have been freed immediately or if the cupbearer would have remembered and talked about him to Pharaoh immediately, Pharaoh would have been like, so he can he told you what a dream meant. That's great. I employ a hundred guys that can do that. That that means nothing to me. But now, two years later, in God's perfect timing, Pharaoh has a dream and nobody else can answer that dream. You see, God's going to put you in the path of people who no one else can help. God's going to put you in the path of people that no amount of drugs, no amount of sex, no amount of alcohol, no amount of money, no amount of fame, no amount of success has been able to help them, and they are empty inside, and they are looking for answers. God's going to put you in the path of people that just like Pharaoh, nobody else was able to help them out. Even if they spent good money to talk to therapists or they went to uh, palm readers or whatever else they looked for, you're going to have the answer because Jesus is the answer. He's the answer. The other thing that he's going to do is he's going to send you to those who are troubled. Jesus is going to send you into the path of those who are having a bad day because there's just something about struggle that turns our eyes and opens our heart to the reality of God. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, when people are just doing really, really well, the vast majority of people, when things are just going perfect and they don't know Jesus already, aren't like, man, I could really use Jesus to to help me spend all this money. I just don't know what to do with all this money, right? That's not what they're thinking. But when things are tough and they're struggling and they're hurting, then they're open to something besides themselves. And Jesus tells us this is how we are able to serve him. In fact, when he's talking about heaven, this is what he says. Matthew 25, 34 says, Then when Jesus returns, the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father and inherit the kingdom that has been prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will say to him saying, Lord, when When did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say to them, truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. What's God after? God is after the heart of those people who are willing to go after the least of these. This is why we do the community kitchen. This is why we do the the heart of hope ministry. This is why we do free indeed. This is why we talk to our neighbors and our coworkers and our friends and our family because we want to go after the folks that are recognizing their need for something more than themselves. This is who Jesus is going to send us after. The story continues 
And I'll summarize the next few verses. It says, so the cupbearer of Pharaoh remembers the time that Joseph had correctly interpreted his dream. And so he, rec- he recommends Joseph to Pharaoh because Pharaoh's desperate. He knows this dream he has had meant something. He knows that something is coming. He's unsettled in his spirit. He doesn't have peace. He can't rest. He can't sleep. He's looking for somebody. All of these fakes, all these magicians and sorcerers that he's hired, none of them can provide an answer. So now the cupbearer is like, oh yeah, two years ago there was a guy. If you are willing to talk about God, then he will make your words memorable. If you are willing to talk about God, he will make your words memorable. You know, my my wife and I were talking about this last night. I would much rather have what I say to somebody be remembered than for them just to be impressed with how I said it. And I think many times we're so concerned with our eloquence or how we come across or how cool we are. Guys, I gave up the cool factor a long time ago. I'm just, I'm not going to be there, and now I'm a dad, and my six-year-old already rolls her eyes at me, right? So I'm never going to be cool again for the rest of my life. So I don't really care what you think. I'm going to tell you about Jesus because I'd rather you hear his name than go to hell. I'd rather you find what I have found than continue to go through pain and suffering, even if you think I'm a huge dork for it. It's a fine trade-off for me. If you're willing, though, to talk about God, people are going to remember that. They might seem like they blow you off in the moment, but they're listening. And it might be two years later, but when things happen, they're going to remember. And you know who they're going to come talk to? They're going to come talk to you. Isaiah 55, 11 says, God says, so shall my word that goes out of my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish that which I purpose." And it will succeed in the thing for which I have sent it. If you speak God's word into people's lives, it will accomplish what it's supposed to accomplish. You don't have to make it happen. God says he will make it happen. So then Pharaoh sent in verse 14, and he calls for Joseph. And they quickly brought him out of the pit. Just want to stop there for a second. Two years. Two years he's been waiting, but now when it's time, it happens quickly. You're going to notice this is how God tends to act in your life. I hadn't gone on a date in nine years. I met my wife. We were married in six months. Not saying that's a good idea. I'm just saying in my life, God tends to do things quickly. I'll be sitting around and be like, okay, God, when are you, when are you, when are you? And then all of a sudden, it's like, I can't keep up. God doesn't work on our timetables. When when it's time to move, he's going to move. So you've got to be ready. It says, and when they had shaved him, or sorry, and when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream and there is no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said that that you are able to hear a dream and you can interpret it. Joseph answered Pharaoh, It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Then Pharaoh told Joseph about his dreams, and he let him know that no one else was able to explain what they meant. If you are willing to talk about God, he will make you, he will use you to make other people aware of him. If you are willing to talk about God, he will use you. He will use your life. He will use your words to make other people that were not aware of God aware of his presence. Now, how do I know this? Here Joseph is talking to Pharaoh. You know what what Pharaoh's aware of? Pharaoh's aware of what we would call sorcery or witchcraft or demonic or whatever you want to call it out there. But that's what he was used to. He was used to these sorcerers. He's used to these magicians that would come up and through whatever means, black magic, dark arts, whatever that they were doing, they would give him answers. This is what he was aware of. He was aware of the god Ra and all of the Egyptian gods. And Joseph walks up to him and Joseph says, no, 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 you're not going to give me credit. My God is going to do this for you. My God is going to show up, and he's going to give you the answer that you're looking for. You see, God will not use you if you keep the glory for yourself. 
God will not use you for him if you keep the glory for yourself. And we see this happen all the time, where people start getting used by God's by God's, by God, whether they be pastors or evangelists or on TV or whatever, and all of a sudden they start getting this notoriety because they've got good stuff to say, but over time they start keeping the glory for themselves, and you know what happened? Scandal breaks in the news, and we find out that they've had 25 affairs. That type of stuff happens not because God isn't real, not because Jesus doesn't save, but because people start keeping the glory for themselves, and they start justifying their sin because of that. Now, something else in this passage that, I, passage that I want you to see is that Joseph was aware of the audience that he was going to have. He didn't just go before Pharaoh in the clothes and the condition he had been in for the last two years in prison. He understood he was going to go and stand before Pharaoh, so Joseph went and he shaved because the Egyptians did not like facial hair, and he put on a new change of clothes. Then he went and talked to Pharaoh. If you want to be used by God, you have to be aware of the audience that you're going to be speaking to. And you have to take the steps necessary to relate to people where they are. I personally believe that we lost a whole generation out of the church because we had a generation or two that demanded that people meet them at the church level instead of people in the church meeting them where they were at. And when we do that, we might as well kiss people goodbye because they don't want to hear our gospel if we're not going to show them that we love them first. If we're not willing to speak to them on their level. If all we do is speak to Christianese, all the, they can't understand what we're saying. Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Nope. That blank stare and smile, that's what you're going to get. And they're going to walk away and they're going to forget about you. 1 Corinthians 9, 19 says, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became like a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I might share with them in its blessings. You want to be used by God, you have to know your audience, and you have to be willing to speak to people where they are at. When I used to serve in Skid Row, one of the things that they, that they taught me, and then we would teach the teams that would come out there, is you never speak to a homeless person that's sitting on the ground, standing up above them. If you're going to speak to a homeless person that's sitting on the ground, you sit your hind end on the ground next to them. It may not smell good. It may not be comfortable, but they're going to be able to receive from you face to face. You know who else doesn't speak to us from the top down? Jesus. God could have demanded that we speak to him like this, but he became one of us so he could speak to us like this. We follow that example. Last week I got asked a question and it kind of tickled me. Um, I got asked by somebody, Pastor Tanner, would it be okay if we put an ashtray outside under the canopy? And this, he was scared to ask me. Yeah. Well, well, we just I, I know I, I know that people shouldn't smoke, but but can we just have an ashtray so they so they have somewhere to go? I said, yeah, they might smell like hell, but we don't want them to go there. Right. I mean, come on. That's a joke. If you smoke. OK, like, no, I'm not I'm not slamming you all this morning. That's just a bad joke. But that's the reality, right? The cigarette butts are going to go somewhere. I'd much rather them be smoking a cigarette and then come into church than go away and not come back doesn't mean that we condone every type of behavior. You bring your beer, I'm going to make you pour it out before you walk into the door. But you know, there are certain things that we're going to be understandable of, and we're going to try to meet people where they're at. We have to be aware of our audience. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, verse 25, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. Our job is not to tell people everything that's wrong with them or everything that, that they're not doing well. Our job is to tell them what God wants them to know and to reveal Jesus Christ to them. Verses 26 through 36 summarize. So Joseph told Pharaoh at this point, 
that there were going to be seven fruitful years of Egypt in Egypt, followed by seven years of famine. And he suggested that Pharaoh find a wise man to put in charge of storing 20% of the harvest during the good years to use during the bad years. You know why this is important? Joseph didn't just show up and point out everything that was going to be wrong. Joseph showed up with a solution. Too many times we are so focused on what people are doing wrong in their lives that we're not willing to offer what they could be doing in their lives. We're not willing to come alongside of them. And it's never enough for you to tell people, you know, you know, Sean, aside from being a klutz and just being a drama queen and falling down on the ground a lot, um, you know, you could, you should just really be a better husband. Now, Brittany said that you're amazing, but I think you should be a better husband. Just figure it out. Is that, is that good advice to somebody? Here's what the Bible says. In fact, I'll give you even a Bible verse. Right? God says you should love your wife as yourself. Okay, you fixed now? You got it? Good. But this is what we do to people in the church. We, we tell them what the Bible says. Sometimes we even attach a Bible verse to it, and then we send them along like we did something for them. No, 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 no. Having a solution is not telling somebody what they should do. It's showing them how to do what they should do. It's coming alongside of them, walking with them, explaining it as they go, picking them up when they fall to the ground, and helping them. You know what the Bible calls that? Discipleship. We are to know God through discipleship. We're the disciplers. We are walking alongside of people. Well, Pastor Tanner, I'm new to this. That's fine. You've taken a baby step. You can help somebody else take a baby step. You're further along than they are. If you know Jesus and they don't, you have something to give them that they don't already have. If you are willing to talk about God, he will give you the words to say. This is probably the biggest reason I find that people are intimidated to talk about their faith. Well, Pastor Dan, I don't know what to say. Well, I get that. I get that it can be intimidating to talk to somebody. But you know what? God will give you the words to say if you'll trust him with the words. He will give you the things, the ideas, the thoughts will come flowing out of your mouth naturally. If you stay in contact with him, if you stay in relationship with God, he will help you in those times. Luke 12, 8 says, and I tell you, this is Jesus, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the son of man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. When they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Even when you find yourself in big situations, God's going to show up. Or if you find yourself sitting at the coffee shop and somebody, you overhear somebody talking about having a bad day and you say, hey, can I pray for you? Or you run into somebody at the supermarket and you're like, hey, how's life going? And they say, you know what? I just found out that I have this and I got to have surgery. And you're like, hey, can I pray for you? Or you see somebody that's, you're driving somewhere and you're busy, you're running errands, but you see somebody has a flat tire and you stop your car, you get out and you help them change a tire and they say, thank you. And you say, hey, Jesus, Jesus loves you. In any of those situations, the Holy Spirit is going to give you the words to say. But you got to open your mouth. You got to be willing to open your mouth. Verse 37 This proposal pleased Pharaoh and all of his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all of this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and all of my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards to the throne will I be greater than you. I'm going to summarize the next verses. Pharaoh gave Joseph his ring of authority. He gave him royal clothes. He gave him a royal chain. He gave him a chariot that the people of Egypt had to bow down before. He even gave him the daughter of one of his top officials as a wife. And then Joseph set about doing the work that he had suggested. If you are willing to talk about God, he will increase your platform. You know what your platform is? 
Your platform is what God has done in your life. Your platform to be able to speak from into people's lives is the awareness and the experience and the knowledge that you have of what God has done, maybe not even only in your life, but what he's done in the lives of other people. Joseph's platform was was as a slave speaking to Pharaoh. After a five-minute conversation, because of Joseph's obedience and his willingness to talk about God, his obedience to endure suffering, and his obedience to who God was and the dream that God had given him, God increased his platform from the lowest man in Egypt to the second in command of the entire nation, the most powerful nation in the world at that time. Finally, finally we see the dream recognized. It's taken 13 years but the dream has been recognized. And now Joseph's platform has expanded because now Joseph doesn't have to be afraid of talking about his God because he's talked to Pharaoh about God. If you've talked to Pharaoh about God, you can talk to anybody about God. And Pharaoh kind of likes this God now because God has given him an answer and has shown him how to save his nation. So now Joseph doesn't have to be concerned about offending anybody. Now when Joseph wants to talk about God, people are going to listen because he's number two in Egypt. How could God increase your platform? Maybe you become that person at work that instead of people avoiding, you become the person that they seek out because they know that you have the wisdom of God. When people are struggling or going through heartache, they seek you out because they know that you have compassion and mercy and grace and love that doesn't make sense, that they're not getting from anybody else, that you offer forgiveness and hope that they're not going to get from anybody else. They're going to seek you out and God's going to expand your platform and you're going to have a reputation of someone that has answers. The last part says, so during those seven good years, Joseph had two sons. And he named his sons, I have forgotten my hardship and past. That was the first son's name. And the second name was, God has been faithful to me in the land of affliction. Everything happened as Joseph said that it would. And Pharaoh directed everyone to Joseph for directions. The famine did not just affect Egypt but it affected the entire area, the entire world around it. Verse 57 says, Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain, because the famine was severe over the entire earth. If you are willing to talk about God, he will use you to save others. If you are willing to talk about God, he will use you to save others others. This is the most important thing any of us can do with our lives. This is the greatest calling any of us has for the rest of our lives is to tell people about Jesus and to bring them into his kingdom. There's nothing more exciting. There's nothing more fulfilling. There's nothing more enjoyable that you will ever experience than telling another person about Jesus. Anybody here relate to that? Anybody in here ever had somebody respond to Jesus because you told them about Jesus? Guys, it's good. It's good. I mean, there's a lot of things in this life I enjoy, but there is nothing that compares to seeing someone come to relationship with Jesus and knowing that their eternity has been secured because of a conversation that God allowed me to have with that person. There's nothing better than that. And you never know when God's going to use you to save someone. You won't do the saving, but he will use you to see that person saved. I understand that this is a topic that most of us feel is beyond us. And because of that, every every year or so, we offer a conference called the Make Known Conference. This year, the Make Known Conference is going to be May 4th and 5th. Ron and Judy Radicke from the Oasis of Hollywood, the, the place I was talking about a little bit ago where I used to work at Skid Row. Ron and Judy Radicke... They're amazing. They've spent 40 years of their life teaching people how to tell people about Jesus. They're going to be here May 4th from 9 a.m. to 1 for a conference. It's going to include a free brunch and child care. And then they're going to be here Sunday morning and Sunday night. I really want to encourage you to come. Give up four hours out of your year to come and learn how to casually and confidently and comfortably talk to other people about Jesus. Because once you get hooked to this, it's going to be the greatest thing you could have ever experienced in your life. 
the dream God gave Joseph wasn't about him. There was blessing with it. There was joy with it. But God gave Joseph a dream to save the world. God wants to give you a dream. You know, I I talk to people through this series, and I keep hearing, Pastor Tanner, I want to know what the dream is for my life. Pastor Tanner, I want to know what God wants to do with my life. Well, the number one thing I can tell you that he wants to do with your life is save other people. And this doesn't have to be a crazy thing, right? God's not asking you to put on a white shirt and a black tie and go knock on people's doors. He's not asking you to to walk up to people and everybody you see be like, would you like to hear about my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Absolutely. Yeah, that's not going to (laughs) happen. Not going to happen like that. Unless God, that could happen, that it is possible, but most of the time, they're just going to run from you. God's not asking you to become some weirdo. He's not asking you to carry around a 5,000-pound Bible that looks like, a, that looks like a, a spotlight every time you turn it in the sun. He's not asking, all he's asking you to do is be willing to tell people about him when opportunity presents itself. But if you are willing to talk about God, lots of opportunities will present themselves. And all of a sudden, you will find yourself living on mission in a way you've never experienced before. Your life will have more purpose and meaning and value than you've ever imagined. And you will walk around with the joy of the Lord because you are seeing souls go from death to life. And you will see people entering into the kingdom of heaven. Would you bow your heads? first step in all of this, though, is you got to have a relationship with Jesus. Because if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you don't have anything to share about. You've not experienced anything. And I'll tell you this right now. Every person in this room that has a relationship with Jesus will tell you that there is nothing more important that you'll ever do than ask for salvation, ask for forgiveness, and receive the gift that Jesus gave you by dying on the cross for your sin. That's the first place it starts. But for everybody else in this room this morning that that you've asked Jesus to save you and to be your Lord, I want to encourage you to respond to this message in a different way. I want to encourage you to step out in faith and begin to talk to people as opportunities present themselves. And you know what? You may need some encouragement this morning. You might need some prayer. You might need some help. And if that's you, if you're sitting in here today and you're like, Pastor Tanner, I just, I don't know how to do this. I'm not comfortable with this. Then I want to ask you, if you would, while we, while we worship to this last song, please get out of your chair. Get out of that comfortable place. Come down to the front. And Pastor Linda and I want to pray for you. We're going to pray for the Holy Spirit to fall upon you this morning, to make you bold, to give you courage. We're going to ask him to open your eyes and for you to begin to have opportunity after opportunity to share the love of Jesus Christ. Because if you are willing to talk about God, he will use you in incredible ways. Would you stand to your feet this morning, church?